swept wing stalls from theory to reality. Swept wing stalls remain one of the most underappreciated threats at the aerodynamic edge of the jet performance envelope. They demand not only theoretical understanding but operational clarity, especially for those flying swept wing jets in real world conditions. Swept wings are optimized for high speed flight. They delay drag rise and improve transonic performance, but they come with trade offs. One of the most critical is span wise flow, air moving outward along the wing toward the tips. Mismanaged at high angles of attack, this tends to cause the wingtips to stall first, potentially shifting the center of pressure forward and triggering a pitch-up moment, sometimes abruptly. If the pilot doesn't recognize the aerodynamic condition and intervene early, it can escalate quickly. In certain aircraft configurations, particularly those with T-tail designs, a nose-up pitch moment during a developed swept wing stall may lead to deep stall behavior. In these extreme and rare cases, the horizontal stabilizer may be blanketed by disturbed airflow significantly degrading or even eliminating pitch control authority. Deep stalls are often associated with fully developed dynamic stall conditions and can be particularly difficult to recover from if not recognized and mitigated early with timely, precise angle of attack reduction by the pilot. Fortunately, a variety of design mitigations help manage this behavior. Wing fences limit spanwise flow. Washout reduces angle of attack at the tips. Leading edge slats delay stall onset. The list continues. Moreover, modern fly-by-wire aircraft often incorporate flight envelope protections to help pilots maintain safety margins and prevent inadvertent excursions towards the stall, provided those protections remain active and functioning correctly, of course. But none of these unfailingly prevent stalls. They only shift the margins. The more complex the airplane, the more complexly it can fail. Aerodynamically in normal operations, danger increases below L over D max speed in the region of reverse command. In this region, a small reduction in airspeed resulting in a nominal increase in angle of attack to maintain level flight can lead to a comparatively large increase in drag, requiring significantly more thrust to maintain the intended flight path. Unchecked, the condition snowballs in severity from there. If the thrust response is delayed or insufficient at high or maximum settings, angle of attack increases further, drag compounds, and the flight path management controllability degrades fast as stall angle of attacks are achieved. This relationship is particularly critical on approach with limited time and altitude available, necessitating thrust and speed stabilized approaches. That said, this aerodynamic condition is not just a low altitude and low speed problem. Inadvertent slow flight progressing towards a swept wing stall at high altitude compounded by thrust-limited conditions and degrading energy states can be quite insidious, leaving few options. Simply put, in this unaddressed flight condition, the airplane is coming down one way or the other, either in control or out of control. The knowledgeable high-altitude-aware crew will make an early decision for the former, with an expeditious descent and full-thrust acceleration above LVD max speed, typically two or above climb or cruise Mach number before leveling off at a lower altitude. In fact, this scenario is one of the reasons why the 2008 High Altitude Supplement to the Airplane Upset Recovery Training Aid Revision 2 was issued. This excellent supplemental resource emphasizes early recognition, thrust and angle of attack management, pilot readiness, and decisive correct crew actions at high altitudes, flight level 250 and above. Two real-world cases make this point. First, Air France Flight 447. On June 1, 2009, an Airbus A330 at flight level 350 over the Atlantic lost valid airspeed indications likely due to pedal probe obstruction by ice crystals. The autopilot disconnected and the crew, misinterpreting the situation, made nose-up inputs that led to a high-altitude stall. The aircraft remained stalled for over three minutes before impact in the ocean, killing all 228 people on board. The BEA cited failure to recognize the stall, inadequate manual flying skills at altitude, and insufficient training in high-altitude stall recovery as contributing factors. Second, Pinnacle Airlines Flight 3701. On October 14, 2004, a Bombardier CRJ-200 operating a repositioning flight with no passengers climbed to flight level 410, exceeding the aircraft's certified service ceiling under the conditions. The aircraft entered repeated stalls resulting in dual engine flameout and subsequent core lock. The crew was unable to restart the engines and the aircraft crashed near Jefferson City, Missouri, killing both pilots. 
The NTSB cited unprofessional behavior, operation beyond aircraft limits, and improper handling of the double engine failure checklist as causal, with inadequate training as a contributing factor. The common thread? Unrecognized or misunderstood stalls, mishandled energy states, and lack of preparedness for the conditions faced. At APS, we've trained tens of thousands of swept-wing jet pilots in upset prevention recovery training, or simply UPRT. What's clear across the board is this. Simulation alone is not at all enough. That said, simulators are valuable. That's why we integrate class-specific advanced simulators and type-specific virtual reality training into our programs at APS. But they are not at all a complete solution. Cognitive neuroscience confirms this. Two key areas stand out. First, cognitive load and startle response studies show that the brain's cognitive load and decision-making processes differ substantially between real flight and simulated environment. Real-world flight introduces genuine physiological stressors and unpredictability that simulators cannot fully replicate, affecting a pilot's ability to recall and execute trained procedures under stress. One study published as startle effects on pilot performance during critical events in the International Journal of Aviation Psychology in 2013 found that the startle response can impair pilot performance for up to 30 seconds during critical phases of flight. Second, concerning physiological and emotional responses, the real world is simply more demanding. Pilots experience significantly higher heart rates and reduced heart rate variability during actual flight, especially under workload or surprise. These physiological stress indicators are directly linked to impaired executive function and reduced decision-making capacity under pressure. A NASA Langley study titled An Analysis of Mental Workload in Pilots During Flight Using Multiple Psychophysiological Measures, published in the International Journal of Aviation Psychology in 2002, showed that pilots face much higher workload in real-world flights than in simulators. Translation, the human brain doesn't respond the same way in a simulator as it does in a real jet, and when it matters most, that difference matters a lot. That's why swept-wing jet pilots must train in aerobatic-capable, spins-approved jets above flight level 250. There's no substitute for the high-fidelity startle, buffet, instability, and thrust-limited realities of high-altitude flight. This is where judgment is built, where pilots calibrate their mental models, and where proven effective actions and decision-making becomes intentional and instinctive, a true and accessible core competency. And when that training is integrated on the same day with class-specific simulator scenarios and type-specific virtual reality, and delivered by full-spectrum UPRT experts, it transforms mere awareness into operational readiness. So this is how we move from check-the-box training to the paradigm shift of real-world survivability, from theoretical understanding to decisive intervention. Every pilot trained in control all the time. That includes you, your crew, your passengers, the traveling public. They rely on your training when seconds count. And the good news? The solution already exists. Purpose-built, proven, and available today. So folks, until next time, fly smart, train with informed purpose, and lead by example. We're all in this together. You got this.